read out of one chapter. It's out of chapter 5. In this book called Ancient Mystical White Brotherhood by Frater Achad. And now, I thought I would try this manner of moving the book and not the camera when the camera's stationary. But gosh, I can't hardly read those words. Okay, this is talking about prayer and the subjective and objective part of mankind. Prayer is the innermost desire of good. When man desires to follow the path of regeneration and purification, to build the new foundation for the new pillars of the new temple of Solomon, the temple of the soul, and that nothing will destroy it ever, it is necessary to first cleanse the channels of communication so that our messages of inspiration, as we send them to you, are properly received and are crystal clear, free of any distortions or misinterpretation in meaning to your understanding consciousness. First, one must cleanse and awaken the five physical centers so that the seven spiritual centers might radiate brightly. Prayer is the first step in the fullness of spiritual realization. For remember, spirit is ever willing. Spirit does not demand, does not command. Spirit is ever willing. Now then, when man becomes fervent in his desire for righteousness, in the conscious or objective thinking, he is beginning to cleanse. The, the, mm, to purge all that which the conscious or objective mind has accepted in error from the five physical senses. Steadfast and persistent, without fear, without doubt, the conscious or objective state becomes illumined with desire for good. Now, when that of good leaves the objective thinking, it passes to the subjective and there continues its cleansing of the error, which the objective has sent to the subjective. When man of earth continues along constructive, pure, unselfish ideals, the subjective becomes completely premeded with spiritual creative records. It is then that which man calls super... It is then... That which man calls superconsciousness of spirit can express its everlasting, eternal willingness. Then shall come to pass the statement so commonly used in orthodox theology, the power descends from on high. Let us mention the magnet, as when holding the magnet beneath a piece of paper or glass, upon which are placed bits of metal, which will respond to the attraction of the magnet. As the magnet is moved about, the tiny metal particles form a pattern. Now this pattern could not be formed regardless of the magnet unless the tiny metallic particles were there. Now that which man has learned to call the subjective mind, when it has received thought pictures of love, peace, harmony, contentment, devotion, all that which is in accord with God-man, there is an attraction for the power, the magnet of the superconscious power. The willingness of spirit is then able to manifest. For it cannot manifest until it has that which, with which to mani- make its manifestation. Therefore, in silence, meditation, and concentration, any devotion to good, call it what you will, sets in motion in the objective mind that which is the first beginning on the path of the ascension or the regeneration. We have reasoned with you that man lives by desire and that in speaking of man's unregenerated desire, God lives by desire. Yes, but it is always righteous desire, not in the least limited or subjected 
to that of the five physical senses. When the subjective mind remains unregenerated and man is separated from the physical coil through what has been called death, when in that state and when in time he desires to return to the physical plane to finish unfinished business, he returns with just those qualities into which he was subject to by the subjective mind of his former life. They are still a part of his desire pattern. Now this, we are aware, is in direct contradiction to much of which man of earth today understands. But when this law is understood, man shall be mindful how he weaves the daily portion of life's pattern allotted him to weave through his living. Hence the age-old statement, as you sow, so shall you reap, until by continued mistakes, pain, and suffering, he learns the lesson. Why pain? Why suffering? Why want? Why lack? Why limitation? Are they the result of disobedience? In... Some incarnation? Nay, nay, nay. It is an accumulation of repeated unfinished business of many lives and many incarnations. The rejection of facing the response abilities of life and the principle of truth. It therefore behooves man to seek a righteous path. Fear, doubt, and emotionalism are contributing factors in your everyday terminology. They are the contributing factors to an unsound subjective intellectual picture, making it difficult, though not impossible, for intelligence to permeate the intellect. May we repeat, as we have oftentimes stated mortally, man is a weakling. Spiritually, he is a giant. Every fragment of doubt, fear, and superstition shall be removed from the subjective chamber, lest they continue to retard progress. Eventually, that which man of earth has learned to call death shall be annihilated, for there is no death. Can man of earth so live life's pattern that it is unnecessary to return and claim another physical vehicle? Our answer is yes, yes, yes but he shall pass through the regeneration. When mortal man will use for himself that which he suggests to his fellow man to use, he will become a good teacher of truth, first to himself. In one of our previous instructions, we said man shall share with his fellow man only that which he possesses. And have we not also stated professing is not possessing? When one really possesses that, the radiance of spirit, it illumines the maintenance, the countenance. And this, his fellow man will say, What has he, what has she, which I do not possess? For the eyes shone forth as stars in the firmament, and behold, the countenance thereof was radiant as alabaster, and the feet, understanding, were as gold, and the raiment, aura, white as snow. When the woman whose physical habiliment was tortured with an issue of blood for many years and she had spent her whole worldly possessions and yet the issue of blood remained, she touched the hem of the garment. Does the universe have an aura? Yes. Do they, ha they who dwell in the universe have an aura? Yes. Do nations have an aura? Yes. Do cities have an aura? Yes. Do races have an aura? Yes. Everything that lives has an aura, dear hearts. So the woman who had reached forth touched the hem of the garment. The garment she touched clothed a physical habiliment, and that physical habiliment clothed a soul, and that soul was subject to but one power, the oneness of being. Therefore, the, there was but one aura in that garment, the aura of peace, love, healing, dear hearts. You will remember the remaining part of that narrative. 
The Nazarene saw her not, neither did she behold the countenance of the Nazarene. And yet he said, What manner of man has touched me? He was informed by the disciples that none had had unaware that the woman had touched the garment. The Nazarene said, Verily, for this moment I felt a virtue leave me. What a beautiful symbology man has here. The Nazarene is the embodiment of the Christ consciousness, as all mankind is the embodiment of the Christ consciousness. The twelve disciples surrounding the Nazarene, symbolizing in man of earth the beautiful thought pictures, the twelve powers of man spiritually expressed, the thoughts of righteousness expressed, sent to the subjective chamber, giving protection to man physically and spiritually. What symbology bears the press of the throng? The disciples were within the penetrating circle, mind you. The throng was seeking, were they not? Among their number were many who were anxious to be healed of body, symbolizing the first steps in desire for regeneration. All this was symbolized in the consciousness of the woman. Mind you, she did not let doubt interfere. She did not let fear interfere. She reached through the throng, the press of the crowd, with but one desire in objective consciousness, one desire to reach the master. That part of the aura which became premeded with righteousness blended with the aura of the master, Jesus. Her divine self, her master in consciousness, became awakened and the issue of blood cleansed, uh, ceased. The Galilean knew when he said, Arise, take up thy cross and follow me. Not follow him as the man Jesus, he did not mean this, but following the Christ light of the inner God-man. When the inmate, no, when the innate Persistent, unmoved, fervent desire remains steadfast in the objective consciousness. There can be no subjects in the subconscious chamber to misguide the subjects of the flesh habiliment. God-man comes into his rightful heritage and rules on the throne of authority, on the seven spiritual centers radiating their spiritual light and power through the, th- the etheric body purifying and spiritualizing the physical centers and the pillars of the Temple of Solomon. In the spine, now this is a really interesting part, in the spine are two central nerves known to man of earth as the great ganglia of glanglonic system or glanglonic system of nerves. They are referred to in your holy writ as well as the teachings of free and accepted masonry, as Boaz and Jachin, which were given by Solomon to Hiram of Abeth in recompense for his service in the construction of the temple. In the lower part of the spine of the human, or physical habiliments, is a portion of gray matter similar in construction to the gray matter of which the brain is made. In the front or in the region of the navel is likewise a similar substance of gray matter. Man does his thinking in that region of the abdomen, right in back of the navel. And over a fine network of nerves, its messages are sent and reach the substance in the lower part of the spine, known as the kundalini center. That center acts on you, you... That center acts as your present-day telegrapher's key and sends the messages up the ganglionic system, or nerves, to the brain. This is referred to in your holy writ in the book of Revelation as the twelve branches of the tree. Now the messages that reach the various cell centers of the brain are sent through the physical body, to each intelligence or nerve center. Through the physical habiliment or 
trillions of minute nerve centers, intelligences in their own right. They shall accept whatever message is sent to them and respond in accordance to that message. Therefore, if they receive a message of distress, not if they receive a message of distress, mortally so, that is the only message they can respond to. But if they receive a message of constructive or affirmative structure, that is the message they shall respond to. Like, I'm going to interject here, like sometimes when I'm sick, I, when I feel sick, I say, oh, I feel so bad, my this or that hurts on my body. Well, that's the message I'm sending to my subconscious, and that's all it has to work with. But if I would instead, and I often will do this when I'm thinking properly, if I said, I can get better of this, I, I will feel real good in just a little while, then I'm sending a good constructive message to my subconscious, and it has that to work with instead of the uh, negative thinking. Therefore, now I'll read again. <laughs> Therefore, it behooves man at all times to think in an affirmative manner, even though he is becoming interested in that which is foreign or strange to him. It is unwise for him to become destructively critical, for the truth, all, in truth all things are possible. Remember always, these pillars kept in perfect order, keep it keep in perfect order, the physical structure of the temple of Solomon, the temple of the soul. Likewise, in your holy writ, in the book of Revelations 22.2, you will read, The branches and the leaves were given unto the nation, which means mankind, for the healing, and healing is constructive. Therefore, all thoughts should be constructive and not in the least wise negative. It is unwise for man to say, I do not know, or I am not interested, or I do not care. All ideas are worthy of consideration. For all constructive ideas come from the vastness, or from the constructive source or seat which man has learned to call God. God is not man, as man beholds himself. God is power. God is truth, God is love, and that which, that which teaches man the power of God, the love of God, and the truth of God is worthy of man's consideration and acceptance, regardless of the channel through which it comes. The Nazarene said, Unto him who keepeth my law I shall give unto him for an inheritance, the heathen. In your present interpretation, the heathen, is, under, is understood as one who is without understanding or learning, and that is untrue. When Jesus made that utterance, the heathen were considered to be quiescent, humility, and acceptance. Therefore, the Nazarene was expediently wise when he said, to inherit that which promulgates truth is, is to inherit the power of the understanding of the power that promotes life. Therefore, the temple of Solomon becomes as substantial as man in his thinking causes it to be. Now mind you well, as man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And the heart that the Ga Galilean referred to was the brain, that is, the heart of man, for each part and particle of the physical habiliment, or the temple of Solomon, responds to man's thinking as it passes back and forth through the pillars of the temple, known as the gan ganglionic system of nerves. I'm probably pronouncing ganglionic back wrong. Has it ever occurred to you that upon hearing some distressing news, you have had the experience of a weak, nauseating feeling in the region of the navel? or if you have become startled over some sudden news which you have accepted in a negative manner. That is because that, that sinner has rebelled against the negation 
or physical weakness that man experiences with a physical reaction. Man so often complains physically of a pain across the small of his back and attributes it to some physical weakness. That is not true. It is that sinner known as the Kundalinic sinner rejecting that which is untrue and endeavoring to separate the wheat from the shaft so that the message passed up to the brain through the pillars of the temple reaches the twelve cardinal cranial nerves uncontaminated from error and sends to the cell structure of the brain the true and uncontaminated message of life, peace, power, and plenty. We trust you shall, norm, you shall mentally digest and assimilate this information. Many have misunderstood much of what they have read in books about the construction of the glenglonic systems of nerves, and they will not be in agreement, perhaps, with that which we are stating. However, with that we are not in the least wise concerned. It is our endeavor to lead man of earth from the unreal to the real, from darkness into light, from death into life, from immortality, no, from mortality to immortality, life eternal. There is but one life for man to live, and that life is continuous regardless of what that which has been spoken of, mentioned or written about down through the centuries, as you reckon time. That life is allotted into portions. Those portions are known as rebirth. So it behooves man in his thinking to set his house in order. Let us be clearly understood. It is not God's decree to our dictum that man shall reincarnate or be born again. As man is now experiencing life in his present physical temple, he can make this adjustment by following the path of regeneration and rising in consciousness, thus making it unnecessary to choose another physical body in which to correct his errors or pay back his debt. As man lives in each physical body, he incurs a debt or creates the thought desire, the thought desire, which shall bring him back in another physical tenement or another temple of Solomon. You will remember the narrative of the wall of Jerusalem being repaired. That is what rebirth means to man, returning to repair the walls of Jerusalem. And that repair can be accomplished in the present incarnation by creating no further error in thinking. Let man's thought be pure and righteous, which is right and uncontaminated by the antiquity of race consciousness. Separate the wheat from the shaft and let your wheat be milled into a perfect loaf leavened with the leaven of righteous understanding that you may feast upon that which spells out freedom and liberty. The Nazarene likewise said, By their fruit shall you know them. The apple tree bears apples, not a plum or a pear. Each tree its own fruit. So the Galilean was expediently wise when he made that statement. By their fruits shall you know them. Mortal man is inclined or prone to live a life or expression of pretense. Outwardly he may manifest righteously and inwardly be filled with contempt. Now, we do not mean to be destructively critical, but you have found that that to be so, and man's inward thinking by the outer or his inward emotion. Let me start that over again. Now, we do not mean to be destructively critical, but you have found that to be so, and man's inward thinking or his inward emotion never becomes so enshrouded by the outer pretense that it absolves him from creating an error within himself. First man shall be true to himself, and then he shall be true to his fellow man, for by being true to himself he is true to his God. And the proper message, the affirmative message, is passing back and forth 
through the great pillars of the Temple of Solomon, and reaching the cells in the brain, and putting all in righteous or rightful order. And I'm going to end this with uh, something Neville Goddard said about, you know, where in the Bible it says the man, the woman is subject to the man. And people said, okay, you got to obey your husband, women. That's not at all what that meant. And Neville Goddard explained it very well. He was talking about the objective and the subjective, like this book is talking about. The objective is like the man who puts the ideal into this the subjective, which is the woman. And she, in some mysterious way, just like with the sperm and the egg, and we don't know how the baby is put together, but in the dark, in, in the negative principle, it comes about. So when you put ideas into the subjective, it's the man part of you, because you have a male and a female part, that puts the idea into the woman part of you, which is the negative uh, in the dark part. But she accept that, accepts as true whatever you put there. If you put wrong ideas, she doesn't distinguish, oh, that's wrong. She only can work with what you put there. And if you've been putting ideas of negative thoughts and lack and all that sort of thing into your subjective part of you, then that's all she has to work with, and she has mysterious ways that we don't understand of making it come about. But if you will watch all your thoughts and send only good and constructive thoughts, that's all she has to work with. And then what she brings about in her mysterious way will be good. And see, some people use that scripture to say, oh, you gotta, you got to behave women and mind your husband and, you know, all that sort of thing. And they never get that there's a deeper meaning to that passage. And it's not about a man and woman's relationship to one another in a marriage. It's about your own male and female parts of yourself. And it's kind of like, you know, the negative is what develops the picture. When you used to the, take pictures, they had to go into a dark room to develop the negative. The negative is very necessary and we have that part of us that we suggest ideas into, and it doesn't behoove us to think, well, that person is so bad, because then that's all we're sending to our subjective to think about. And we even might say, well, the evil is so strong, they're able to do this and that, and they're going to kill off a big portion of the population. I hear a lot of uh, worry-mongering about that, the Illuminati or the secret government. And, you, and they have to tell you what they're going to do. Well, you know, I think, well, no, maybe they don't have to. Maybe deliberately it is told what they plan to do so that you, with your imagination, can help them do it because you're going to worry and you're going to put it in your subjective female part of yourself and help make it happen. And And so I don't listen to 